Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome tonight to tonight's LCBO virtual event, Portugal, Wines of the Sun, boasting both ancient winemaking traditions and amazing modern value. The wines of Portugal are having their moment in the sun. Tonight's event has been brought to you by the LCBO in conjunction with our trade partners. Hi, my name is Mark Staples, and I'm an LCBO wines buyer, as well as a longtime wine educator. And I'm really excited to be here tonight to help you discover a little bit more about the wines of Portugal and the renaissance that the country has been undergoing over the last 20 years. Joining me tonight is sommelier and wine educator, Michelle Paris. Hi there, thank you, Mark. Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm glad you were able to join us tonight. Um, my name is Michelle Paris. And as Mark said, I am a wine educator and a certified sommelier. I am the owner of Adventure in Wine, a uh, wine uh, a wine school that has pivoted to being a virtual wine school. Um, I started the school about six years ago and uh, really love teaching and talking about wine. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Portugal and about possibly why uh, por Portugal has has developed the way it has. Um, Portugal sits alone. It's very far away from everybody else. It only has really one neighbor, which is Spain. Um, so it is really developed in de developed independently. Um, one of the things that uh, happened in the 1850s, uh, si similar to er everywhere in, in Europe, or was disease. Powdery mil mildew and downy mildew, along with phylloxera, really decimated the Portuguese wine industry. Uh, and many vineyards were not replanted after this happened. Um, the early 1920s or the early 20th century was a really tumultuous time in Portugal uh, in terms of uh, political unrest. And it uh, became an authoritarian right-wing uh, government or uh, region in the 1930s. And that lasted uh, 40 years until, the less, until there was a coup uh, by the left wing in 1974, which just goes to say that they were really very isolated for a very, very long time and not modernizing. Um, so in 1907, and throughout this time, the quality of the wine was really coming from um, the cooperatives. There was not a lot of money for innovation or development. Um, in 19, uh, uh, 1986, the country became part of the European Union. And it wasn't until 2009 that official appellations, official uh, classifications for the different areas in Portugal were created. This is just to say that Portugal is really very new in terms of the, coming into the modern world of winemaking, really only since 19, uh, 2009. So they've come a long way since then. A lot of the small winemakers that used to sell their grapes into the cooperatives are now making their own wine and proud of the wine that they're making. Money, innovate, money investment has come into the country and that has helped wineries uh, modernize and innovate. So we've really seen a tremendous growth in Portugal over the last 20 years or so. I was in Portugal a number of years ago uh, as a judge at the, um, the National Portuguese Wine Awards. And I spent a lot of time tasting wine over five days for the competition. And I was amazed at the range of wines and the quality of wines that were being produced in Portugal. So I'm really excited to be here to run through these flights, this, these wines with you, to talk to you about these wines, and also to throw in a couple of food pairings for you. Mark? Well, that's great. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, I'm super excited as well, because all that modernization really has hopefully translated into the glass. And I'm happy to help lead this exploration along with you um, so that our viewers can learn a little bit more as well. So um, before we get underway with the tasting, I just wanted to remind everybody about our social responsibility mandate and that if you're tasting along with us, which I hope you are, please taste responsibly. And if you have any questions, 
please enter them in the chat and we'll try to get to them during the performance, during the uh, show here. All right. So we're tasting eight wines tonight and uh, we're going to be tasting a range of wines from around the country, but all still wines. And in fact, traditionally, Portugal has been known better for its fortified port wines. That's really what they're most famous for. But we're not going to be touching those this evening. We're really focusing in on the still wines and the wines that we're tasting tonight are a real indication of what's been changing over the last 20 years in the country. So I think that uh, we're going to start with a couple of white wines, and we're going to start with one of the most famous wines of Portugal, and that's Vino Verde. Vino Verde is a part of Por Portugal in the far northern uh, part of the country along the Spanish border, and it's really well known for its light, crisp, easy-drinking whites. And tonight we have two examples. Before we start tasting, I wanted to just comment on the fact that all eight of the wines that we're tasting tonight are blends. And in fact, they're all blends of native Portuguese grape varieties. And that's really the product of that long, long history of grape growing that Portugal has, but also the isolation that Portugal has was under, uh, didn't really allow to import a lot of different grapes. And so this is a really a chance for us to explore some grape varieties that perhaps many of us are not all that familiar with. So the first wine we're going to taste tonight is the uh, Gisela Vino Verde from Sogrape. This is a non-vintage multi-year blend, um, and it's only 9% alcohol by volume. So it's very, very light for a still white wine. The wine and the winery itself, although it's been around for a very long time, has had a lot of investment over the last 20 years, especially in the winery. And these wines are made under full temperature uh, control in stainless steel tanks, which really allows the winemaker to preserve the freshness and the fruitiness that they're looking for. This wine is a blend of native grape varieties, Lurero and Trajadura, along with some other native white grape varieties. And those are two of the main grapes of the Vino Verde region. So having given you a little background on the wine, why don't we give it a taste? All right, then. So we have a beautiful white wine here. It is a very pale in color. And you might uh, notice that if you have a vino verde or have tasted a vino verde before, that there is a spritz. A lot of these wines have a little spritz to them. And that adds a, uh, some really nice, refreshing character. So this wine is, uh, it doesn't have a huge amount of intensity. It's a fairly simple wine. It smells of green apple and pear, green pear, pale lemon, uh, sorry, um, a little bit of lemon. This is, this is a cool, damp area, so we're not going to get a lot of huge flavors here. I'm going to give it a little taste. It's so refreshing. It's got this great acidity, vibrant acidity that just screams for some food. But before I go there, one of the great things about Albarino is that, or Alvarino, or Vino Verde, um, uh, pardon me, is that the alcohols tend to be very low. These are still dry wines, but this wine is only 9%. So if you're looking for a lower alcohol alternative, this is a great option for you. So in terms of food, what we're looking for here is not something that has a lot of complexity because this wine doesn't have a lot of complexity. And so a couple of things that I've picked, um, uh, a dish called amejoas, um, which are little net clams that are just steamed, steamed in a white wine sauce. And you'd have that with some bread and a glass of wine. Just imagine yourself sitting on the coast of Portugal and the fishing boats are coming in and you've got these fresh mussels and you've got a beautiful glass of sparkling wine and it's lunchtime and the sun is shining. Can't we just be there right now? I'd love to. Uh, if you're not interested in clams, uh, something else that would go really well with this would be something like fish tacos. And you can use cod because cod is a very important fish in, uh, in Portugal. And if you're looking for a non-meat um, 
or fish alternative, something like hummus with some olives and maybe some crudite would be a really beautiful accompaniment to this as well. I love this wine. It's a great summer wine, easy drinking wine, um, sitting by the pool or sitting on a patio somewhere. I, I agree, Michelle. It's 100% a patio wine for me. Sitting out in the hot summer sun, it's nice and cold and refreshing. And even in the middle of the day, we can have a glass and still be able to function. So, All right. Well, why don't we move on to our second wine? And we're going to taste a second Vino Verde. This time, we have the Avaleda Vino Verde Lurero and Alvarino. Uh, this is a 2019 vintage. And one of the things about these wines is that they really are meant to be consumed when they're fresh. So these are not wines to buy and store at home. And in fact, if you have them at home, you can't really store them because you're going to be too busy drinking them. Um, Avaleda was established in 1870. And like virtually all of the wineries that we're going to talk about tonight has a very, very long history of winemaking, but it's really only since the 1990s and the 2000s where any kind of investment has happened in the winery and in the vineyard. And there's been such a dramatic increase in quality uh, that it's been almost really astounding to see. Uh, this wine unlike the previous wine, focuses on Alvarinho. And Alvarinho is one of the most important white grape varieties in northern Portugal and really is responsible for most of the very best wines. And will tend to give you a little bit more complexity and maybe a, just a little bit more intensity than when they don't include it. So again, modern winemaking methods, but in a very traditional region. So I think we should give it a try. Absolutely. And because we're... Yeah, because we're tasting two Vino Verdes, it's interesting to compare them side by side and see that, you know, are they the same or are they different? Well, they're certainly different. Well, they're the same and different. Um, but this is smells quite different than the first wine. This is riper. There's more peach aroma. There's more kind of a red apple aroma here as opposed to the green fruit that we had in the first wine. So that's already telling you something. The other thing about this wine is it's, well, it's still low alcohol. It is only 11%. It's not as low as the first wine that we had. So a lot of kind of fresh herb note on this one, um, some lemon lime as well, but that, that riper, those riper flavors of peach and maybe some red apple as well. Let's give it a taste. I love it. <laughs> it is wonderful. It is, it's, it's fuller bodied than the first one we had. The first one we had was really crisp. This one is rounder and it still has lively acidity, but it's a little softer than the first one. And so for this wine, um, what we're going to pair this with is um, we're going to go to uh, Portugal's national dish, which is bacalao. And bacalao is salt cod. Now, bacalao, there are about 9 million recipes of bacalao in Portugal. Every grandmother, every maybe even every grandfather has their own special secret bacalao recipe that has been passed down from generation to generation. But bacalao is generally salt cod, some potatoes and onions, maybe some hard boiled eggs as well. Um, uh, the thing about bacalao is that it's made with salt cod. So it tends to be a salty dish. And acidity is a, a natural foil to salt. So if you have something that's really salty, maybe you want something that has a little bit of acidity in the wine and it'll balance everything out. So this wine has great acidity and I think it'll work really, really well uh, to counterbalance um, the salt it's, and the salt will, will also counterbalance the acidity. For this dish, again, what I would also recommend would be deep fried calamari or tempura, deep fried vegetables. I think both of them would work really, really well with the Christmas crisp, crispness of this wine. So good. So good. And I really love the aromatics on this wine. It's so much more exuberant than the first wine, really floral and, and uh, really attractive. It makes you want to have a sip. Absolutely. Really yummy. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we 
slide into the reds now. We, uh, we've tasted a couple of Vino Verdes and uh, our appetite and our palate has been peaked and we are re ready to dive into the reds of Portugal. So we're going to start with the uh, Sogrape Silken Spice Red, the 2019 vintage. This is a multi-regional blend. Uh, so it's, it's a, a, a production that allows the winemaker to choose the grapes from the regions that best suit what he wants or she wants to produce and really gives the winemaker much more flexibility in making something that they're trying to make. Uh, the grape varieties in this blend are Turiga Nacional, which is one of the most important red grape varieties in Portugal, and we'll see it in many of the blends that we taste tonight, along with Alicante, Busquet, and Baga. And these three native grape varieties, although we don't see them elsewhere, really play an important role in the Portuguese wine industry. The wine is paying tribute to uh, the spice roots that were developed in the late 15, uh, 1400s by the Portuguese explorers as they traveled around the world and opened up trade routes to the Orient and uh, really tipping the hat to uh, the silk and spice that moved back and forth. And really, this is interesting because it's that, that dichotomy of tradition with modern winemaking and the modern modern winemaking comes out in a hundred percent stainless steel production so the wine sees no oak it's fermented in stainless steel it's it's re aged or rested in stainless steel before it goes into bottle and then it's released and it's ready to go so why don't we give it a taste fantastic all right well this wine is deep ruby it almost has a little bit of a purple color to it as well and on the nose, it's, there's tons of fruit aroma here, really dark fruit, the black plum, black berry, and like a, almost like a blackberry compote, slightly cooked fruit, jammy fruit. Um, really, really intriguing on the nose. It's really soft and rich on the palate. It's, it's got some uh, 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 fresh acidity here. It's not too much acidity, but it's got some great fresh acidity and very, very low on the tannin scale. So if you're not somebody who likes a lot of drying of, of the mouth from the tannins, this may be a wine that you would like to go to. What I want to pair with this wine is a dish that is uh, a dish from Porto. And I had this when I was in Porto. And I'll tell you, I ate this and I didn't have to eat for about four days. It's <laughs> enormous. Uh, it's called uh, Fr uh, Francesquina. And it's a sandwich. It is made with uh, smoked cured pork sausage um, that's seasoned with garlic and paprika. And also there's some fresh sausage in there. And it's put in between two pieces of bread because it's a sandwich and topped with melted cheese and it's put in a bowl or a plate and there's this tangy beer sauce that goes around it. It's just crazy. And sometimes they even crack an egg on it. It's like, it's like a, 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 an over the top uh, coque monsieur. And it also comes with French fries because you need those French fries. Um, but it's really, really good. And I think this kind of wine would go very well with that, this kind of food. Um, this is the kind of wine that I would want to drink with that, with that dish. Um, but don't tell your doctor you've had it. And uh, something else that's really uh, a little bit simpler than this and something that you can make at home would just be a barbecued burger with a really great tangy barbecue sauce. And I think that kind of tang, um, that fruity tang in this uh, wine will pair really well with that. And as a vegetarian uh, option, think about an, an eggplant lasagna or a zucchini lasagna, or an eggplant or zucchini lasagna, something with a lot of, with some nice weight to it that will balance out um, this, this wine that has some weight. And I'm getting hungry. I also am getting hungry. <laughs> so I, I can't wait to, to have a glass of wine once we're done and have something to eat. All right. Well, I agree. Uh, that's really soft, but 
really tasty wine ready to go. And I think that it would be, it would be great. I, with a burger, um, I think one or two glasses and I'd be pretty happy. All right. <laughs> Why don't we move on to the next wine? So our fourth wine is the Casa Santos Lima Quinta de Bons Ventos 2018 vintage. This wine, along with the next wine after that, both come from the area surrounding the capital city of Lisbon, uh, located in the center of the country. And really, the vineyard was developed to produce product for the city. And so it grew up with the city. And the wines that are made there are really much more for the urban dweller than they are for the country dweller. The winery has been owned by the same family for over five generations, but there was a real modernization push in the 1990s, and they've really driven towards the export market, and we're fortunate that Canada is one of their markets, so we have a chance to have it here. The blend uh, is Castelao, Camarate, Tinta Miuda, and Turiga Nacional again. Um, and the Turiga Nacional, although it's not a large part of the blend, gives it a little bit of backbone and a little bit of dark, spicy fruit to it. So a little bit of oak aging with this wine, but not too much. And in fact, we'll find that with the vast majority of Portuguese wines that we see in market, Oak is really almost never a dominant characteristic. If it's used at all, it's used just as a little seasoning ingredient. And so it really allows the fruit to shine through. But why don't we give it a taste, Michelle? Fantastic. The interesting thing about the wines from the, the Lisboa area, or there are a number of different appellations around Lisboa, but because of the expansion of Lisbon, um, at least three of these appellations are going to be disappearing uh, in the not too distant future as, as, uh, as the city expands, which is unfortunate. So, yeah, so this is ripe, but not overly ripe, not like the one that we previously had, which was very, very ripe. Um, this is ripe, but not overly so fresh blackberries, fresh black cherry, and a slight spice. And that kind of clove or slight, slight spice would be coming from some of the oak aging. It's really fresh. It's got great acidity. It's not heavy at all. It's not one of these big, heavy wines. It's quite um, it's moderate body. It's got very fine, beautiful, fine grain tannins and it's mouth watering. My mouth is still, my mouth is still watering. It's craving some food. Most wines crave food. Um, so here um, for the, those of you who don't want to have meat, um, what I think would pair really well here would be a, a mushroom risotto. And again, you don't have to put cheese if you're vegan, but a mushroom risotto, if you, if you want cheese, if you're vegetarian, but if you're not, uh, don't, don't put the cheese in. Um, but I think that the kind of that mushroom note and that earthy note would pair very, very well with this wine. Um, for, uh, for, uh, for those who do want a meat alternative, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in sandwich mode today. I don't know why. Um, there's another, uh, sandwich that's typical in, in, in Portugal, uh, called Masa de Pimiento y Bifana. So this is thinly sliced pork, uh, cutlet that is marinated in garlic and white wine and then fried in a in like a real rich rich fatty sauce <laughs> slapped in between two pieces of bread now the the um the real richness of this wine um not sorry the real acidity of this wine the freshness of this wine i think will really cut through that richness of the food so i think that it's a really wonderful pairing i think it would work really really well again this is not a complicated wine so we don't want to pair it with anything that's terribly complicated and that's why i've been kind of going to these kind of more uh simple foods because you don't want to overwhelm the wine with any with too much aroma or too many too many flavors so i think the sandwich would be delicious i agree and to be honest most of the time we're not eating super complicated food so it's nice to have a 
a wine that's not super complicated to have with what we eat. And I really like that little spicy note that the wine shows. Uh, it would go with a lot of different kinds of foods. Really tasty. Yummy. All yes. right. Yeah. Lucky to live in Lisbon, uh, if that's what you're getting close by. So if we move to the next wine, our fifth wine also comes from the region around Lisbon. It's the Vidigal Wines Porta 6 2019 Vintage. Um, this winery, again, established in the, the early 20th century. Um, and the label, which uh, is kind of fun, represents the Lisboners' day-to-day -day lifestyle and routine. And it's really it bringing to life the style of the wine, and it's meant to be for every day. The, the grape varieties in this wine are Aragonas, which is a synonym for Tempranillo, that most famous of Spanish grapes, along with Castellau and Turiga Nacional again. And the Tempranillo will typically give you those kind of darker fruits and the Turiga a little bit of structure. And so when we taste this wine, we might expect that it should have a little bit more body, but who's to know? The winemaker will dictate how, how the wine ends up. So why don't we taste the wine? Perfect. Okay. Well, on the nose, this has um, a lot of juicy red fruit, kind of like the, that, the last one that we just had, but here it's a little bit more complex. Here we're getting a little bit of coffee, a little bit of mocha and some dried herbs. And there are more tannins in this wine, not a huge amount of tannins, but there are more tannins in this wine. So I really feel the texture in my mouth. Um, so here, because it's a little, there's a more tannin and there's a, it's a little bit more complex. I want to pair it with something that is a little bit more complex and I'm going to pair it surprisingly, this is a red wine. I'm going to pair it with a fish dish. I want a heavier kind of fish, um, but I'm going to cook it, uh, with tomatoes and olives and olive oil to make the wine more rich and fuller bodied. So it'll pair really well with this, this, uh, fuller red wine. Another thing that would work really well with this would be pork tenderloin. And I'm talking an herb crusted, roasted or barbecued pork tenderloin. That's going to play off the dried herbs that I'm getting in this wine. And again, I think that you can make some kind of jus with the wine um, to pour over the uh, tenderloin. I think that would be a tremendous idea. Sounds fantastic, Michelle. I have to say. Yeah, you and All I are right. going to get to you, you and I are going to have to get together and have a meal when it's. We will have, we'll have a meal <laughs> shortly. That's for sure. All right. Well, why don't we move on to the next wine because we're uh, we're we're chugging right along. We have three more to go, and here we have the Cava Veljas Cathedral Reserva Dao 2019. So from the Dao region in the more northern part of the country. Um, again, the winery has been around since 1939, so a long history. And the wine itself is a combination of Tinta Roriche, uh, Alfrochera, and Turiga Nacional. And so we see these grape varieties more and more commonly as we travel around the country because they are some of the most important grape varieties in Portugal and tend to be used in the wines that have the highest quality levels. So why don't we take a taste? Perfect. I'm, re I'm really interested to taste the Dao, I have to say. Well, Dao is a really interesting area. It's surrounded by three different mountain ranges. That protect the region. Mm, yummy. That protect the region from the cool air coming from the ocean and the really hot air that's coming from Spain. 
And so it's a really, Dow tends to produce wines that are very elegant, a little, a little step above an elegance than the wines further, just a little bit further north uh, from the Douro area. Um, this is a perfect example of that. It's got um, fresh fruit, really bright acidity, but it's also got a little hint of smoke along with the, the fruit. And the fruit, there's a note, a slight note of dried fruit as well, but it's mostly fresh. Prune a little bit of prune and some plums. Now in the mountains, um, there is an animal that lives, uh, likes to live in the mountains and that's the wild boar. Um, and so I think something uh, going out hunting one day, grabbing, you know, getting yourself a boar and then bringing it home and making a boar, a wild boar stew. I think that would be a great pairing for this wine. Um, the richness of the boar will be balanced by the bright acidity of this wine. I'm going to go back to bacalao as well, because I said there were like a gazillion different bacalao recipes. And so if you had a bacalao recipe that had a little bit more to it, like one that had a, a potato gratin as opposed to just potatoes, it would make the dish richer. It would make the dish a little bit heavier. And this way you could pair it with a red wine. And I think this red wine would be very, very good with this. And that smoky flavor that I'm getting in the wine would pair nicely with any kind of grilled vegetables, any kind of grilled vegetables where you might also get that, that hint of smoke in the vegetables as well. So that's what I have for you on this one. Awesome. All right. Well, I think it's time to move on to our penultimate wine here. And this wine comes from the Douro Valley, arguably the most famous region in Portugal when it comes to making wine and famous really for port wine, for that strong, dark, long lived fortified wine. But about 20 years ago, this producer, um, Vincente Faria, who were established in 1758, so over 350 years ago, they saw the writing on the wall and they realized that the demand for port around the world was rapidly declining and they needed to be able to do something with their grapes. And so they made the revolutionary idea at the time of switching production away from fortified port wines to still wines. And really their neighbors thought they were insane because that tradition dictated that your best grapes always went into port and never were used for still wines. I think the last 20 years have, has proven the producer right as more and more of the grape growers and the producers in the Douro Valley have shifted their production away from fortified wines to high quality still wines. And now many producers are using their very best grapes for that. And really the quality has shifted and increased so dramatically, it's been really wonderful to see. This wine is made from the traditional uh, port grapes, Turiga Nacional, Turiga Franca, and Tinta Rorish. And I think that ideally we're going to find some of those port flavors um, without the port body in the wine. So why don't we taste and see? Fantastic. Well, for those of you who have had port wine before and smelled port wine, um, there's definitely um, aromas of black fruit, black berry, black cherry, black plum, and quite ripe as well. In fact, I'm sitting in the Douro Valley right now. That's what we have behind me. And you can see uh, it's a very, very hilly, hilly. It's got steep hills that are along the, uh, the Douro River. And you can see in the background the terraces that they have to cut into these hills in order to be able to plant the grapes. It's a fascinating and beautiful area. So this wine also has the hallmark of those Douro uh, port wines, the ripe black fruit, the black cherry, the black berry. There's a real kind of licorice note to this as well, black licorice, and maybe even a hint of chocolate. Making me hungry again. Mm -mm. <laughs> and it's got fresh acidity, not the same freshness that the Dow. Uh, wine had, but it's still quite fresh and present. 
It's soft. It's rich. Very, very light tannins here. And it's, um, I think we need something to, uh, from the, the region. Um, one of the local uh, thing, uh, dishes that they have is uh, something called cabrito asado. Asado means barbecue in Spanish and Portuguese. And cabrito is a kid goat. So you could have baby goat or you can also have lamb. It sounds worse when I say baby goat, doesn't it? Uh, you can have a lamb um, as an alternative. Uh, but again, I think that having something that is grilled, is, that's going to bring out kind of the smoky and um, caramelized aromas from, from, from barbecue would work well with this kind of licorice chocolate black plum. If you want something a little bit more simple, a grilled veal, veal chop would also work really well with this. Awesome. Mm. Well, I can't wait for the summer and when I can really start firing up the grill, because I think that wine will become part of my staple lineup. So, okay. Well, we're on to our last wine of the night. It's the uh, Heredad de Esperau, Esperau Reserva 2017. So this is a wine that comes through uh, our vintages, a section in the LCBO. Uh, it is available all year round and it is a much more premium offering than the previous wines we've looked at. It comes from the Alentejo uh, in the center of the country and really a region that has developed a reputation for much higher quality, much more complexity and much more interesting wines over the last 20 years than the more traditional rough wines that existed in the past. The first vintage of this wine was in 1985, and so now 35 vintages under their belts, they've really uh, figured out what they can use and how they can use it to make the best wine they possibly can. Um, the one difference from this wine, this wine between the other wines is that there is a little bit more oak use. The wine sees 12 months in oak once it's done fermenting, and, uh, and then a further eight months in bottle before the wine's released. So that adds another layer of complexity and a little, a little bit more intensity to the wine. The blend of grapes is Aragonish, which again is Tempranillo as we know it in Spain, uh, along with Trincadero, Alicante Boucher, and very unusual for Portugal, some Cabernet Sauvignon, a grape variety that we don't find much in the country, but that clearly can do a good job. So why don't we give it a taste? Perfect. I just want to make one little point about Aragonesh and all these different names of, for the same grape around the world. It's a nightmare for wine students <laughs> to learn these. <laughs> all right. Now, just putting the, no the, the wine to my nose, the glass to my nose, I'm already smelling something very different from all of the other wines. This wine is very savory, and you smell the Cabernet Sauvignon, the distinct aroma of cassis or black currant. And you also smell the oak, the vanilla, you smell the cedar and some spice. There's a combination of red and black fruit here. It's fresh. It's not really overly ripe at all. It's quite fresh. Oh, I just made a mess. Um, um, it's very complex on the palate and the flavors linger a long time. It's got good concentration of flavors and aromas. Um, that those red and black fruit uh, flavors are coming out on the palate, that hint of vanilla, that hint of cedar also coming out, a much more complex wine than what we've seen before. And because it's complex, we want something that has a little bit more complexity. So I'm going to take a page out of the French cookbook. And I thought maybe something around along the lines of a boeuf bourguignon, some kind of beef stew that has been um, marinated, the beef has been marinated in this wine and cooked in this wine, uh, along with potatoes and vegetables or whatever else that you wanna put in, or mushrooms, uh, whatever else you wanna put in the stew. I th think this would be a fantastic uh, opportunity to use this wine, not only in, in your mouth, but uh, in cooking. And just a hint about that, if you don't want to drink the wine 
because you don't like it or the quality is uh, not great, don't cook with it because you're cooking with something that you don't like. So cook with something that you like. Um, the, in terms of something vegetarian, um, portobello mushrooms have a lot of umami and they're, and they're beefy, they're thick. You can get your, sink your teeth into them. And beef also has a lot of umami. So I think portobello, grilled portobello mushrooms would be a really good alternative if you are looking for something uh, non-meat-based. Well, I really, I really like this wine. Yeah, I do too. It's, uh, it's so different from all of the others. And really one of the things that, you know, this exploration has shown me is that Portugal is really about a range in styles and a range in wines. They're really not uniform at all. Um, and uh, we have a question here from Roger asking whether there's a better uh, or a favorite region for red wines. I think for me personally, I think the Douro Valley is where I would go for high quality red wines, for sure. Uh, I think that there's some really uh, world-class wines being produced there, and, uh, and they can stand up to wines from all around the world. Um, so I think, Michelle, that this has been a very interesting tasting. Uh, I, I love the food matches that you came up with. You've certainly made me hungry here. Um, <laughs> and I can't wait to have a glass of wine and something to eat. Um, so in closing, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, the products that we tasted here today can be purchased at the LCBO, um, either in store or on lcbo.com. And uh, don't forget that right now, uh, six of these wines can be purchased in a special online exclusive box for under $75. So what a great value, six wines, six of the wines that we tasted tonight for under $75, a great way to learn a little bit more about Portugal if you didn't have a chance to taste along with us today. And also don't forget that uh, it, upcoming on May 15th and the vintages release, uh, there will be a feature on Portuguese wines where six new Portuguese wines will be released. And so an opportunity to taste some maybe slightly different or uh, more premium expressions of the wines that we've tasted here tonight. So uh, please tune in to more LCBO virtual events and make sure to visit lcbo.com for more details on our past as well as our upcoming events. I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to taste along with us tonight. And I really want to thank Michelle for joining us and giving us your insight and some great food recommendations. I think everybody out there is probably feeling just as hungry as I am. <laughs> and uh, I think that we're, while well, we're deserving to have a bit of a glass of wine. So remember in closing, please enjoy our products responsibly and have a great evening. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.